Okay, so uh, good uh, afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Oppenheim Lecture 2016. Uh, my name is Zhu Chenbo, and I'm head of the Department of Mathematics at NUS. And uh, I'm quite pleased to see such a large audience, which is a clear sign of the magnificent pulling power of the speaker. Um, uh, okay, so among other in the audience, we have uh, Professor Ho Te Hua, Deputy President for Research and Technology, and Professor Senzo Wei, Dean of Faculty of Science, and uh, also University Professor Chong Chi Ta, Director, Institute for Mathematical Sciences, IMS. So uh, today's event is jointly organized by the Department of Mathematics and the Institute of, for Mathematical Sciences. Now I shall begin my introduction for the distinguished lecture and the distinguished speaker today. First of all, let me say a few words about the name Alexander Oppenheim. So uh, he started out as a student of G.H. Hardy in Cambridge and received his PhD from the University of Chicago under Dixon in 1930. He joined the previous NUS, at that time it's called the Raffles College at the time, in 1931 as the first professor and the head of the department, and that continued until 1959 for 28 years. I guess uh, you know, now the time is different. Uh, it used to be in the long time ago when you are more or less a fresh PhD, you could join the department as professor and head of department. It's, it's not happening anymore. Uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, he actually had a uh, very eventful for kind of life. For example, during the World War II, he was captured by Japanese troops and was held as a POW in Chinese prison. So uh, later on, Oppenheim played a key role in the merging of Raffles College with King Edward VII College of Medicine to form the University of Malaya. So in 1957, Oppenheim became Vice Chancellor of the University of Malaya at Singapore. And then in 1962, the Vice Chancellor of University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, mathematically, he's famous for the Oppenheim conjecture, which was about the value of indefinite real quadrant form. So the conjecture was settled by the Fields medalist Grigory Magulis in 1968 and 1986 using tools from Wilgotic theory and semi-simple legal. By the way, this is my own field. Uh, so it's really fitting that this distinguished lecture is named after him. Now let me introduce the distinguished guest of this week, Professor Emmanuel Kendas. Uh, from Stanford University, where he is Bernard Simon's Chair in Mathematics and Statistics. Of course, to many of you in the audience, this is unnecessary, but still let me do a brief introduction of him. Uh, Professor Kendas received his diploma from Eco Polytechnic in 1993 and PhD from Stanford University in 1998. Since then, he has been a faculty member at Stanford and Caltech, uh, before he returned to Stanford in 2009 as professor of mathematics and the professor of statistics and also professor of electrical engineering by courtesy. Uh, professor Kendas has an extremely wide research interest and horizon and it covers compressive sensing, mathematical signal processing, computational harmonic analysis, statistics, scientific computing, and application to imaging science in inverse problems. Professor Candace wrote numerous famous papers, and his research has been described by the National Science Foundation in the USA as nothing short of revolutionary. Among his most influential paper is a paper with Terence Tall in 2006, which kicked off the field of compressing sensing, the recovery of uh, which is the recovery of sparse signals from a few carefully constructed and seemingly random measurement. So, uh, Professor Candace uh, received numerous awards and recognitions, including Sloan Research Fellowship, James Wilkin Prize in Numerical Analysis and Scientific Computing, Vasil Popper Prize, the Alan T. Waterman Award, George Polia Prize with Terence Tall, ICIAM Coles Prize, and the Lagrange Prize in Continuous Optimization, uh, the Daniel Hyman Prize, and G.D. Booker Prize from American Mathematical Society. In 2014, he was elected to the National Academy of Science, USA, 
with a plenary speaker of International Congress of Mathematicians, ICM, in Seoul, Korea. So we are very grateful to Professor Candace for accepting the invitation to be our second distinguished guest for the Oppenheim Lecture. So uh, without further delay, let us welcome Professor Candace to deliver his lecture entitled Around the Reprodu Reproducibility of Scientific Research in the Big Data Era, What Statistics Can Offer. So please welcome Professor Candace. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? All right, so I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming this afternoon, and also uh, Professor Zhou for this uh, very generous introduction, and, and Professor Sen for inviting me to Singapore and give this lecture. It's certainly a privilege for me to be here. So I know that I stand in a math department and I should be talking about mathematics, but uh, the lecture for today is more statistical in nature. I think it should be accessible to people with a very um, low level education in statistics, which I'm hoping, uh, because of the great job that Professor Sen is doing at the University of Singapore, uh, everybody has. And um, so uh, what I'd like to do is in this hour is to get you interested in, uh, I think, extremely important problems uh, of our times and the way in which statisticians are beginning to uh, address them. And so uh, we're going to talk about the, scientific, the reproducibility of scientific research. All right, so um, okay, maybe I hope it's working. All right, so it's a talk about statistics. And so just at the beginning, I, I would like to kind of introduce you to sort of a, some sort of a paradigm sh shift. And to understand this shift, we need to go back to the beginning of statistical inference, which is the way we've been conducting science for about a century now. So uh, in the 1930s, uh, Karl Popper uh, really laid the foundation of modern science. And so he looked at the problem of induction. And so to quote him, he said, well, no matter how many, white, many instances of white swans we might have observed, this does not justify the conclusion that all swans are white. And that's a problem of induction. And so what Popper writes next is, well, that there is a, a deductive method to this uh, induction problem, this problem of induction. And so what you do in the sciences, and that has governed science for a century now, is that you advance the scientific hypothesis. And what is a scientific hypothesis? It's a scientific hy it's a hypothesis that I can make predictions. So a hypothesis can only be empirically tested only after it has been advanced. And then this hypothesis makes predictions. So predictions are deduced from the theory and compared with the results of experiments. And when you make experiments, you can either corroborate the standing hypothesis or you can falsify it. Okay, and that's the way we've been doing science. You advance a hypothesis and then you design experiments to test it. Right? So we were very happy with the laws of gravity and we, you know, every experiment we could make would confirm the laws of gravity until something strange happened. And so we changed the scientific theory in favor of general relativity. Okay. At the same time, the founding father of statistics, R.A. Fisher, operationalized this notion that Popper had in mind. And so he's de he developed the concept of statistical testing. And so he's very famous for ha having advanced uh, this paradigm in the statistical community. And so perhaps you've seen uh, this very famous example where you have a lady who is tasting tea and so she claims that she can distinguish whether the milk or the water has been added first. Right? That's your scientific claim that somehow you can distinguish whether the milk or the water has been advanced first. And what you do is, well, there's an unknown hypothesis, there's a standing hypothesis, and of course you can design an experiment to test this hypothesis by perhaps presenting the lady with random cups of teas, whereby you put the milk and water in random order. And out of this, you can actually compute a p-value. And so because it's a bit of a statistical in nature, let me just take a poll. Who has never heard about a p-value? All right, so everybody knows what that is. That's absolutely great. So a p-value is essentially the prob probability of observing something as extreme as the one that you have 
observe under the standing hypothesis that you're considering. Right? And so Fisher introduced this notion of p-values and thereby it completely operationalizes what Popper is advocating where now there's really a scientific method that goes along with uh, the Popperian view of science. Right? And so the p-value for those of you who don't really know what that is, is like you know, you start worried when you have a large deviation from what you expect under the standing norm. Okay. All right. So that's how we've been doing science for about 100 years. Now, the question we'd like to pose is, has something gone wrong? And if you open the popular media, uh, for example, this is a cover of The Economist, uh, October 2013, How Science Goes Wrong you see a lot of alarming articles. And these articles are about the fact that science goes wrong. Right? So this is the headline of the article. Scientific research has changed the world. Now it needs to change itself. Trouble at the lab. Uh, scientists like to think of science as self-correcting. To an alarming degree, it's not. You know, and so you see like articles that start with a bang. So I see a train wreck looming, and so on and so forth. And so you see a lot of articles with uh, um, very negative cartoons where you would see like cartoons of scientists putting some evidence under the rug. And when you look at the articles in uh, detail, in fact, they do actually report alarming things. So what the article reports is that there are many experiments in psychology and many findings that have been reported that do not se seem to stand to close scrutiny. I will focus on two of them. The first one is by an American, uh, where it's reported that an American company called Amgen basically took 53 studies that they considered to be landmark in basic cancer science and set out to reproduce them, and they could not. They could reproduce six out of 53 papers. And we're talking papers published in the top journals in the world, Nature, Science, The Lancet, The Cell, things like this. So this is uh, alarming. Healthcare Bayer, which is a German equivalent to Amgen, uh, ran a similar study where they took 67 seminal studies in a different field of the life sciences, set out to reproduce the findings, could reproduce less than a quarter. And this is not really new to people working in the field. Uh, I got familiar with this through Johan Benjamini, who already a long time ago told us that if you look at the Food and Drug Administration, where when you want to bring things to market, you have to go through several phases that the 50% the of phase three studies, which should be a slam dunk because you pass phase one and phase two, end up in failure. And that this number is rising with time. Okay, so this is The Economist, but wherever you, you, you open the newspapers in the US and in the Europe and maybe in Singapore, uh, you see similar things. The truth wears off. This is The New Yorker, 2010. And you see article littered with very negative wording, such as significance chasing, publication bias. And in fact, I have a colleague at Stanford, John Ioannidis, who is often very widely cited by these papers, who actually claims that his estimate of the number of false discoveries, so to speak, in the sciences is around 80%. Okay. This is the New York Times, it's just to show you the range of the thing, new truths that only one can see. Um, here's an, okay, so you see a lot of articles like this, and essentially every week or every other week you see articles like this. And I don't know about Singapore, but in the US there is an all time law, low uh, public confidence in science, and things like this cannot be very good. So there is a, a, a personal concern, and perhaps even a societal concern is that to kind of this face in science would further erode. And the last thing we want is really to be seen as politicians. And um, so, but I have, we're, the scientific community I have to say is taking this issue very seriously and is beginning to respond in very serious ways. So I'll show you some initiatives that scientists are taking to address this very serious problem. So first of all, this is a, 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 an exchange called the Reproducibility Initiative, where if you find, uh, if you run an experiment, if you, run, if you have a, 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 a protocol, and you're a bit worried that your results might not be reproducible, you may actually submit your protocol to this exchange, and they will reproduce your things for a fee. 
And sometimes they will actually do it for free. So sometimes they will select projects at random and try to reproduce them for free. So we see a lot of initiatives aimed at reproducing um, lab results, which is a great thing. And they're gaining a lot of traction. Another one, which uh, is a step in the right direction, and we may be cynical about this, but I'll say that it's a step in the right direction, is that a lot of top n magazines, science, nature, I'm showing you nature here, are beginning to change their editorial policies. So this is the editorial of Nature dated April 25th, 2013, where Nature fully acknowledges the fact that the, a lot of what they publish does not seem to be reproducible. And to combat this disease, if I may speak in such terms, what they offer is they offer a new editorial guideline where now when you want to submit a paper to Nature, you have not only to submit your paper, but you have to submit data, you have to submit code, and actually, they say that statisticians and quantitative people will actually run through all of this to see how sensitive your results are to parameter choices, model specification, and so on and so forth. Right? And science has a similar, um, uh, has taken similar measures. Finally, I was fortunate enough to attend the meeting of the National Academy of Science uh, last spring, and the president of the academy, Ralph Cicerone, really gave a f his annual address about this topic and urged the scientific community to respond to this, to this problem. Okay, so why is that a lot of science is not reproducible? Well, there are many, many, many reasons for it, and I can't discuss them all. Of course there is fraud, of course there is incompetence, but I think what I want to discuss in this lecture are things that are a bit more subdued, which is that and it's alluded in the title of this lecture, that I think that the big data era has changed the way we do science from a proportion view to a data-centric view. So let me explain this. I think what happens now is that we don't have theories, at least in the life sciences, and what we do is we collect data and then we ask questions. And this new situation makes available large quantity of data prior to the formulation of hypothesis, which is a new thing. And that now, when we actually try to report findings, we would need to quantify the reliability of hypotheses that have been generated by data snooping. And it is completely different from the kind of science that the greats, Popper, Fisher, and so on, had in mind. And so what statistics has to offer to this? Well, it is a still the science that understands what it means to look everywhere and can account for the fact that we're going to look everywhere and can understand the reliability of what you're advancing in the context of all of what, what you're exploring at the same time. So let me uh, just give you a sense of why is it that we may find a lot of findings that can be reproduced. Suppose you're running a lab and you are looking at thousands of hypotheses that you'd like to test simultaneously. And not when I say thousand, I'm really on the conservative side here. You know, people are testing daily billions and billions and billions of hypotheses. But let's say that we're a bit conservative. After all, we're in Singapore, and so <laughs> we want to t test only a thousand hypotheses. But because you're looking everywhere, you're looking at a lot of bogus theories. Right? You're a bit clueless. You're looking at a lot of bogus theories. And so maybe in the thousand things you have to test, for example, let me give you an example. For example, I, I, there might be a disease that I'm interested in, and I want to test whether a gene has something to do with this disease. But there are 300 thousands of genes that I might be potentially interested in. Okay. So we have, uh, have 1,000 hypotheses to, te to test, and of course, not every gene has something to do with cholesterol level. Right? So what I'm, I'm going to say is that, well, your, 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 your thousand hypotheses, well, there are maybe a hundred of them that are awaiting discovery, but 900 of them are what we're going to call null. Right? They're null hypotheses. And so in yellow here, we see the hypotheses, the scientific hypotheses awaiting discoveries, and the white squares will be the nulls. And so we're going to put them, bunch them together, and so here we have our hypothesis awaiting discoveries, and then we have our nodes. And suppose I'm going to test each hypothesis at the time-honored 5% level. Then what happens? Well, 
Here's what happens. If I'm running a study which has power 80%, so what does it mean that a study has power 80%? It means that when, an, when there's a, a hypothesis that is awaiting discovery, I have 80% chance to declare it to be positive. And that's a power. So, well, if the power of the study is 80%, which is a very high number in modern studies because a lot of things we do are prospective, sample size is small, but let's say the power is 80, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to detect 80 of these yellow guys who are waiting discoveries and now they're in green, and so I, make about, I have about 80 true positives. But at the same time, if I use testing at the 5% level, I'm going to detect 5% of the 900 that are completely irrelevant, that are of nulls, and so I'm going to have at the same time 45 false discoveries. And now when I'm reporting, of course I don't know which is which, so I'm going to report the red and the green because I'm just reporting the positives. What we realize is that a large fraction is actually false. And in this example, over a one in three hypotheses is null, so that cannot be replicated. Now suppose that my power is lower. Instead of 80%, now let's say that it's 30%. Then if the power is 30%, then, well, I'm still detecting 45, I still have 45 nulls on the average, but now the number of true discoveries drop because instead of having 80, I have 30. And now the, I'm reporting the blue, the green, and the red, and now I can see that 45 over 30 plus 45 is roughly, um, the false discovery rate is 60%, 45 over 30 plus 45, and now most of what I'm reporting is actually false. And now you'd say, well, Emmanuel, nobody's running statistical studies with power equal to 30%. Well, that is absolutely not true. In fact, most studies have powers even less than this. So here's a meta-analysis performed by my colleague John Ioannidis and his co collaborators looking at thousands of analyses published in the field of neuroscience. And what you see on the screen is a histogram of the power of these studies. And what you see that you have a median roughly at 20%. That is, half of the studies in neuroscience have power less than 20%. There is an anomaly here, which is neurobiology, but most of the studies have very, very low power. Okay, and that's why what is reported in these fields, if multiple comparisons are not taken into account is worrisome. Okay. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, statisticians have looked at this very seriously. And so now I would like to tell you a little bit more about what's happening in statistics these, these days. Um, by the way, uh, I should have said that the person who noted this the first is actually a medical doctor by the name of Surich, roughly uh, 25, 30 years ago. Okay. So, just as Fisher operationalized the Popperian viewpoint of science, Benjamin and Hochberg, in what I consider to be one of the most important development in statistics in the last 30 years, um, operationalized the warning that Shorik addressed to the scientific community. And what they said is they basically they proposed a new paradigm for testing scientific hypotheses, large numbers of hypotheses. And they said, look, you're going to look at a number of hypotheses, H1 through Hn, this is the things we're interested in testing. And what we're going to be interested in is we want to control the fraction of false positives. And so there is a ratio that is of interest to us in this lect lecture, which is a number of false discoveries, stuff that cannot be reproduced, over the number of discoveries that you claim. And what Benjamin and Hodgeberg says is that they said that we should design a procedure that controls this ratio. Right? So this is what they call the false discovery rate, and this is something which is very important for us, which is the expected value. Of course, we have statistics, we have we are performing, we have a source of randomness because we're performing experiments. And so we have, we're interested in controlling the false, dis the expected false discovery proportion, which is a ratio between the number of false discoveries, 
the red thing that I had before over the red plus the green with the convention that this ratio is zero if you report nothing. This is a very natural type 1 error because if I have a procedure that controls the false discovery rate and I'm submitting 100 genes to a biologist and I've a procedure that controls the false discovery rate, let's say at the 10% level, what does this mean? It means that out of these 100 discoveries I'm making, I'm pretty sure that 90 are reproducible and 10 may not be. Right? So you control the fraction of irreproducibility, if you'd like. And not only this, not only it seems like it's a good principle, but on top of it they showed that under independence you could actually design procedures that would actually control this very attractive proposal. And this, this target FDR is something you can control. So you can say, well, I want the procedure such that no more than 10% of my discoveries are in error, no more than 5% or no more than 20%. You control this. And no matter what the target you have, they will give you a procedure that controls the false discovery rate under uh, independence. And this is a procedure that has had an enormous uh, influence on medical research, not on all fields of medical research, but on some. If you are interested in this, a statistic about this paper, that this paper of Benjamin Hotchberg has been cited 30,000 times to date, which is not a, a bad number. All right, so what is the procedure does? Well, the procedure does something uh, very simple to explain, and that's why I'm going to try to explain it, which is what you do is you're, you have these thousand theories that you're trying to assess simultaneously, and what you're going to do is you're going to rank them from most significant to least significant. And one way to, say, to, to do this is to rank or order the p-values in ascending order. So here we have, you know, here in this example I have only 100 of them. And so we're going to look at the p-values for each hypothesis. And what we're going to do is we're going to rank them in ascending order. All right. So here we have tests that are very significant, departures from the standing hypothesis. And here, like, I would not reject the null hypothesis. All right, so we have our p-values. And then what we do is we draw a line where q is your target FDR. So let's say in this talk we're going to say q equals 10%. You want, no, you want on average that 10% of your discoveries may not be reproducible. And so we have this line, iq over n, so i times 0.1 over n. And what the benjamin hochberg procedure does, it's actually looking, plotting this, and it's looking at the last time the p-values cross this line. And all the hypotheses, all the tests with the p-value less than this last crossing point are rejected. So in this example, all the red points are, are rejected, and all the black points are accepted. And so what you would do is these were genes, you would report these genes as having something to do with your problem, and this would not. What's very interesting about this procedure is if you're in a, a discovery-rich environment, in which case you have like a lot of small p-values that you can see here, what you see is that, well, okay, so let's look at a, another distribution of p-values and let's look at the last time this is crossing the line with slope 0.1 or q. Then what we can see is that here we would reject much more. So when there are many more things to discover, the benjamin hochberg procedure indeed discovers many more things. And so it is a very adaptive procedure in the sense that it's really adaptive to the number of non-nulls. And so you can make, make more discoveries when there's an opportunity to discover more. So as I said, this is, has had a tremendous implication in many fields of science for the better. And it's actually quite used at the moment. All right, of course, I, I don't mean to imply that Benjamin and Hochberg were the first to look at this problem of multiple testing. In fact, the field of statistics is populated with giants, and you see some of their faces. But I think what Benjamin and Hochberg have is a new take on this problem, which is really amenable to the large-scale testing that we're doing today. All right, so what the false discovery rate is, is, while well, I'm sure people know about the type 1 error. The type 1 error is a probability of a false positive. But what the false discovery rate 
is it's not just a property of a false positive. Right? That's not useful. What is useful is what the, the false discovery rate is the average, it's a number of, of type 1 errors over the number of things you're reporting. So it's a notion of type 1 error that, is, that has been averaged over what you're reporting, over the selected. Okay. And this is uh, the goal of selective inference, which is that, as I said, in modern data science, what people do is they don't specify a model and then collect data, and then report and perform inference. They reverse the first two things. That is, they collect data, they look at the data to specify the model, and then they proceed with inference as, nothing, as if nothing happened. Selective inference is really about this problem. It's about the problem that you want the original property of inference to hold on average over the selected, after you looked at the data. Okay, so you, it's Basically, the, you want inference to be valid after viewing the data. Yeah, it's very different from, for example, when I was, I was at what I was taught as a graduate student. So just to show you that it's not only about multiple testing, um, so here's another problem that falls squarely into the kind of very important things that we're discussing. You suppose you have multiple parameters like, let's say maybe you compare many, many different treatments. Okay. Which is very common now in personalized medicine and so on. You, you compare very many treatments. A regular 95% confidence interval would say, well, that the interval needs to cover its parameter with change at least 0.95. Okay? What that means roughly by the law of large numbers is that if I look at many parameters, the number of parameters that will be covered by the, co by the confidence interval is roughly 95 or more. So the expected proportion is all right. But that's not what we see. What we see in published science is like when I'm testing many things or when I'm interested in many things, people will not show me 95% confidence for everything. They show me confidence interval for things that look interesting. And so, what we, Sorich again, in the same kind of influential paper writes, in a large number of 95% confidence interval, 95% of them contain the population parameter. But it would be wrong to imagine that the same rule also applies to a large number of 95% interesting confidence intervals. Okay, and to press this point, here's an example. Here I have 20 parameters of interest, which are denoted in black, I have, uh, uh, in blue, sorry. I have statistics about this blue point, which are denoted in black, and I have confidence interval. And now, I'm going to say, well, I'm not interested in these 20 things. They don't look interesting to me. I'm going to be interested in those for which the confidence interval does not cross zero. And that's the one I care about. So when I look at all 90% 90, 90 confidence interval, everything is well, because 17 over 20 covers the true value of their parameters. That's what we learn as undergraduates. But when I look at the selection, that is when I look at the one, the confidence interval that do not cover zero, indicating that something interesting is going on, then the coverage rate completely drops. And in fact, the, the predicted value of the parameter for those is completely off. Right? And so of course this will tend to fail when you replicate. Now, they fail so spectacularly that when you actually, you know, okay, there are lots of applied science say, you know, we don't like multiple testing. Uh, we like confidence intervals, but we don't like tests of hypothesis. And lots of journals have banned tests of hypothesis in favor of confidence intervals. The assumption is when you do confidence interval, it's more serious. And what people fail to underappreciate is that ignoring multiplicity in confidence intervals is exactly the same problem. And when you do so, this is what you see. You see that if you eat a lot of pizzas, it's very good against prostate cancer. I mean, the number of things you see published, so I was looking at the New England Journal of Medicine, arguably a very reputed journal, that argues that eating chocolate is good to get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I mean, I like these articles because I'd like to get a Nobel Prize, and I eat a lot of chocolate, so... <laughs> 
that's good. I mean, there are like articles in Germany making the headlines saying that uh, eating a lot of chocolate makes you much thinner. And why is it that we see this stuff? We see this stuff because people are doing exactly this. They're looking at many effects simultaneously. They pick the promising one. They report confidence intervals after selection as if you did not select. And inference is completely distorted. OK. And the amount of bogus stuff we see published everywhere is really frightening, because people don't do this. OK. All right, so for confidence intervals, you have a notion which is exactly similar to the false discovery rate, which is that perhaps a good strategy might be, well, yes, of course. In fact, you know, in this example where spaghetti sauce and pizza fight cancer, um, the authors looked at a lot of endpoints, what we call endpoints. They looked at a lot of parameters, and they just decided to report the, what appeared to be the most significant one. So now, how do you combat this? Well, you can combat this by essentially porting the false discovery rate approach to the confidence interval world. And what you can be interested in is in the false coverage rate, which is that you may want to collect data, theta 1 through theta n. You have to collect data about n parameters. You're going to select the promising one. So for example, I might look at the distribution of incomes in Singapore and look at the top incomes and say something about incomes at the university. But then once I do this, I want to be able to actually have a, a notion of coverage rate, which is proper. That is, I said that among all, the, 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 I want that the fraction of carving intervals among everything that has been reported be still this 95 or 90 percent, whatever you prefer. And how do you do this? Well, you can do this, and maybe I'll skip this. Benjamin and Yekutieli give us a rule that says that under some conditions you can actually control the false coverage rate so that the covering property is adjusted for the selection. Okay. All right. So just to wrap up this first half of this lecture, what selective inference is, and it's very important, again, I'm going to repeat myself and I apologize for this. What statistical theory says is that you should specify a statistical model, you should collect data, and then you should say something, you should perform inference about your statistical model. What practice does is different. I collect data, I look at the data to set up a statistical model, and I want inference to hold. Okay, so we want inference to hold when selecting promising leads, models that you might fit. See, like a lot of people would do things like this. I give you an interesting data set, they will try a model that doesn't give anything they want. So they'll try another one, and another one, until something works. It's fine to do this, but this searching mechanism has to be incorporated into the inference procedure that you care about. This is not classical, so this is why the field of statistics is extraordinarily active at the moment. And it's so some, some stats not classical that elementary stats textbook don't even talk about this, which is a bit disturbing. So um, if I open an introductory text in stats, people will say, oh, you should select a model by CP. People who teach statistics know what I'm talking about. The others may not. But basically, you perform variable selection. You get a good model, which is, has reduced size and good explanatory power. And then you're going to perform inference about the coefficients. And what you find in every textbook is, well, you get the good old formulas as if no model selection had taken place. And of course, what you see cannot be true. OK. All right, so this was, I can speak for how long? Uh, we have the room until 3.30, but I don't. No, no. OK. okay, okay. <laughs> well, I speak another half hour, and then I'll wrap up. So I got myself very interested in these problems. And what I want to, to talk to you about is uh, a procedure. So, so first, let me issue a disclaimer. You know, science is facing a, what people call a reproducibility crisis. It's much debated in the US and Europe. And of course, someone like me, I cannot fix this. What I can do is I can set out tools so that if people use them properly, then it will help address this problem. 
And what I want to show you is I want to show you one of these tools, which we call the knockoff filter, which was developed in collaboration with my former postdoc, Rina Fogel-Barber, now at the University of Chicago. And it's basically this kind of multiple testing problem where we want to find, you know, we're looking at many things simultaneously and we want to find the stuff that is reproducible. Okay. So to motivate the problem, I would like to start with an example. So this is an example that has been guiding us and this is a problem of finding which locations on the genome are associated with a trait. So you have a trait of interest, for example, it might be whether you have a disease or not, or it might be your cholesterol level, or it might be, you know, whether you have a autistic behavior or not, and so on. And then, well, we have genotype information about individuals. And what we'd like to do, the purpose of genome-wide association studies is to find those locations on the genomes that have something to do with the phenotype. Now, how people do this? Well, they do this through essentially linear models. And so what you're going to do is you're going to model your phenotype as having two components, a genetic component and then a component that is not of genetic origin, what we call, may want to call an environmental component. And the genetic component is going to be assumed to be linear, so we write Y, the response, that is a phenotype, as a, a genetic component plus an environmental component. What might be the variables trying to understand your, uh, let's say, your HDL level, your cholesterol level. At each location on the genome now, we can actually look at, well, the, you know, there are locations on the genome where you and I are different. These are called SNPs. And what we can look at is that for patient I and location J, I can count the number of alleles of a, of a type that we have. And people are different at these locations, so we differ. All right? And then through a linear model, and so here you have to, I have to apologize to the mathematicians. I'm using notations from statistics. So X is a matrix with N samples, that is N people in my study. The number of columns is the number of genetic variants that I'm trying to assay. All right, so I have n people and n gene locations, location on the genome that I'm trying to say something about. All right, and I'm going to relate them by a linear model, and I would like to be able to report locations on the genome that have something to do with my disease, and in such a way that I control the false discovery rate. That's our goal. Okay, so when I say that this location seems to be associated with HDL, high glucose level, I'd like it to be not a certainty, but I'd like to be sure about this. So how do I do this? Well, I'm telling, I don't know, well, I'll, I'll tell you how you do this, but first let's see how people do it. Okay, so just to set up notations, and please, you have to interrupt me if something is not clear. We have a vector of responses. I don't know. So HDL levels, cholesterol levels. We have a data matrix of interest, a design matrix, encoding genetic information. We have the regression coefficients beta plus the environmental factor. And what I would like to do is I would like to select location on the genomes such that I'm, pretty f I'm fairly convinced that there's something going on over there. So that if people want to invest time and money following on these leads, they would not waste more than, say, 10% of their time or 5% of their time. Okay, so I want, the goal is to select as many variables of interest that are li likely to be relevant to the problem I'm looking at without too many false positives. And what I want is I want to control the false discovery rate, which is the expected ratio between the number of false positives and the number of findings I'm going to report to my friend, the biologist. All right. Okay, so for those of you who are familiar with this, it's a bit like a multiple comparison problem where I have lots of regression coefficient that I wish to test simultaneously. Now, we're a bit in a strange world where we may have more variables and samples, in which case the model is not identifiable, and we'll need to talk about this. Okay. All right. In fact, I want to do more. And you'll see why I want to do more in a minute. I'm not going to bother with you too much. But I want to do more. That is, I'm going to ask you one more thing. 
then when you tell me that this gene has something to do with the disease, that is, you, you believe that the variable is in the model, that its regression coefficient is not zero, I want you to tell me whether it has a positive effect or negative effect. I want you to tell me the sign or the effect direction. All right? So not only is this, but I want to be more stringent. I want to be able to select features such that I'm going to count an error when you say that a variable is a model when it's not, when it has no association. Or I'm going to also count as an error when you say, ah, OK, this variable is a model. It has a positive effect when, in fact, it has a negative effect. Okay, this is what we call the directional false discovery rate. Um, in fact, Benjamin Yannikuccelli kind of proposed this, and it's for those of you who do a bit of statistical testing, it's of course associated with a very nice concept introduced by Gerlman and Turling in 2000, which is these sign errors. Is what you want is you want to be able to test reliably whether a parameter is positive or negative. Okay. And so mathematically, this is what I want to do, is I want to return a set of findings, location on the genome, and then there will be the location with a positive effect, the location with a negative effect, and each time, for me, a false discovery will be, well, you select a location when, in fact, either there is no effect there or the effect is in the opposite direction. Okay. All right. Okay, so how many people have heard about the lasso? I live at Stanford. It's extremely lasso-centric, uh, but I don't know about the University of Singapore. So how many people have learned about the lasso? Learned or heard about it. Heard about it. <laughs> heard about it. <laughs> I see. Okay. I know one person has heard about the lasso. <laughs> um, okay. So. The lasso is a, is a, is a statistical uh, procedure where um, basically what you do is you run a model. And so you're going to be basically what you're going to do is you're going to try to fit the data. And so you're going to try to minimize the residual sum of squares, which is over here. So you try to dis minimize the discrepancy between the observed data and your prediction. But you penalize this by an L1 norm. So what it says is it's a method that will promote sparsity. So the lasso is actually a technique that was introduced a long time ago that essentially tries to fit a model by selecting variables. Now, I know it's a, a top-notch math department, but suppose I give you data y and I set lambda to be infinity then what would be the lasso solution? And now you have to tell me. Zero. zero. Because everything you put in here is, 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 okay, so it's zero. If lambda is zero, what do you get? You get the least square solution. And so what happens is when you start at lambda equal infinity, the lasso is not finding any variables. And when you're going to decrease it, it's going to start including more and more variables. Well, that's what the lasso does in a, in a nutshell. At lambda equals infinity, nothing is included. And as you're decreasing it, it starts to include variables one at a time. OK. All right, so here is an, an experiment. And, 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 and let me uh, say a bit more. I hope I'm not going to go too much over time. Let me say a bit more that in the sciences, what people will do is because it's known that the lasso returns a sparse solution, people would select, would take genetic data, GWAS data, set a value of lambda, see who, which lasso coefficients are not zero, and report them. And is that a good thing to do? And this you see all the time. So to just mimic what people are doing in, 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 in science papers, Here's an example. So here's a, a model in which I know the ground truth. So we have a simulated data set with 1,500 people and 500 locations. And I fit a model with lambda equals 1.75. And you have the properties I adver advertise, which is that, well, I have 500 variables. And you see a, a lot of estimated coefficients are exactly zero. And in this example, about 55 are non-zero. So the lasso will say, will fit a model with 55 variables included out of the 500. 
and they are there. And then 450, roughly, are equal to zero. And then the question I have to you, for you, is like, should I go out and report these things? And if I were to report them, would I control the false discovery? Would this result be reproducible? If I take another set of people and I apply the same procedure, how is this going to change? Right? So let's look at this point, for example. Is it a false positive? Is it a true positive? Well, what do you think? Well, it's, it's not a trivial question. In fact, in this example, I, since it's a synthetic example that I constructed myself, I know the ground truth. And the ground truth is this. The green points are true positive, things awaiting discovery, and the black points are false positives. And so if I were to report everything the lasso deems to be significant in this example, I would have a very high false discovery rate. In fact, it would be 26 over 55. Roughly one discovery out of two that the lasso makes is wrong. Now you'd say, well, maybe I can fix the problem. And the way I could fix the problem is, well, let's go back to this. Maybe I could try to understand and write down a test to know whether this is big enough to be reported. To do this, though, for those of you who a little bit of statistical theory, I would need to know the sampling distribution of the lasso, which is a huge problem, which nobody knows what it is. And even if we knew it, the sampling distribution of this guy would depend on the value of all zeros of regression coefficients, so it seems that there's no way out. Okay, this is what I wrote. I would need to estimate the false discovery proportion. Honestly, you and I have no idea how we could possibly do this. Okay, in fact, just to show you a little bit what happens when you fit a lasso model, which is, you know, I'd like to say that the lasso is the least squares of the 21st century. And that's literally true. When you look at the number of paper, papers published in the quantity sciences, in data science in general, with the name lasso in it, it's a very high percentage. Okay, so here what we have is we have the penalty parameter of the lasso, and we see two curves, a black curve, which is a tr the, what I want to call the true proportion of, the true discovery proportion, and we see a red curve, that's the red curve that concerns us, which is a false discovery proportion. As we can see, lambda is very large, we include nobody, so the true positive rate is very low, the false positive rate is very low, and as we describe lambda, the lasso starts to select things, and if we focus on the false positive rate, it goes up. Because the more we include variables, the more errors we make. Now, why is it that the lasso is actually making errors? There are many reasons for this. But one of the reasons is maybe you have a variable that happens to be correlated with a noise, and so you'll select it. Or there's another more pernicious reason why the lasso makes a lot of errors. Uh, some of my colleagues would not like to hear this. But maybe the variable might happen to be correlated with a signal that you have not yet included. And so you'll select this guy instead of, of the right guy. OK. All right. So to do this, to kind of try to understand how we could use a lasso to control the false discovery rate, we're going to introduce a new idea, which we call the knockoff filter or the knockoff method. And um, well, perhaps you don't know what is a knockoff. A knockoff is a fake. Right, so uh, there are no fakes in Singapore, but if you go to Venice and you see people in the streets and they want to sell you Louis Vuitton's back, chances are that they're knockoffs. <laughs> right? It's a fake variable, and so I cannot say it better than theaterize.com. It's not a name brand bag, it's just a cheap knockoff. And what are we going to do? What we're going to do in this work is we're going to introduce a bit of poison in the system. That is, for each SNP, each real variable you give me, I'm going to go out and create a knockoff, a fake imitation of this thing. Right? We're going to construct a knockoff version, which we're going to call X wiggle J. And what we're going to see is these knockoffs are going to serve as a control group. And they're going to uh, let me estimate the false discovery proportion. OK. so. For each variable xj, I'm going to construct a fake variable by purely computer means, as we'll see. And we're going to construct them in such a way that they correlate with the noise in just the same way as the true variables. But also, they're equally correlated with the missed signals. Right? I may miss some variables, but then the knockoffs, they will correlate e equally with the missed guys. 
Okay, so in other words, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to set up knockoffs such that xj or x wiggle j or its fake variable is equally likely to be selected when it's not in the model. Now, how do we do this? The mathematical recipe is very simple. I have a bunch of variables, and this you can imagine that they're columns of your data matrix. And they have a certain covariance structure. They have a certain gram matrix for those of you who prefer math terms. So prime means transpose. Like it's a statistician's notation for transpose. And what I want is that when I look at, I'm going to construct a new data matrix in such a way that the, covari the covariance between these new columns is exactly the same as the covariance between the original features. So these fake SNPs that I'm constructing, they have the same correlation structure as the original SNPs. But they do something more. They also have this property that a fake SNP has the same correlation with the true SNP than the true corresponding true SNP with the true SNP. That not only I replicate the correlation of the, of the true variables in the statistical model, but there is also this cross-correlation that is preserved. Okay. Now, how do you do this? This is a numerical problem. Right? I give you a matrix X and you, with columns XJ, and you have to do this. So you do this by matrix computation. Now, how you do this, I'm not going to detail it because that's not important for a lecture like this. You do this by matrix computation. You can optimize your knockoff. So you can use numerical optimization to do it. But the key point are two things. One is I don't need you to go back to the lab and make new data. It's generated by the computer. So there's no need for new data experiment. And also, this thing makes no reference to the, the response. Why? Yes, I need x tilde to be, so I want you to hold that thought. I want x tilde, of course I can do this by telling so. All right. So I want x tilde to be different from x. And in fact, I want it to be as different as possible, as orthogonal to x as possible in some sense. All right. But I want you to hold that thought for a second. Right. And that's why we call numerical optimization, is to do this in such a way that are, they are as different as possible. Yes. And what I was saying is that to do this, I don't need to look at the response y. OK. Now, what do we have this? And that's my math slide. So my math slide is right here. It says, OK, why do we construct knockoff in such a way? Well, let's look at how the, the variable correlate with the response. So let's look at the distribution of a variable, the correlation between the response my glucose level, and a variable, my genotype at this location. Well, since y is given by this kind of linear, exp it has a mean x beta and it has an error z, well, it's going to be the correlation between the variable and the mean plus the correlation between the variable and the noise. But now, you see, now I can call these two properties together to say, well, if j is not in the model, is a SNP that has nothing to do, it's a gene that has nothing to do with cholesterol, then the way it correlates with the other genes, well, it's exactly the same as the way its knockoff correlates with the other genes. And so this is equals to this by construction. And because the knockoffs have the same covariance, this has the same distribution as this by construction. And that has to do with the fact that the knockoffs have the same correlations among themselves as the original variables. And therefore, this is distributed just as this. So it's very interesting, this, because it says that if a gene has nothing to do with y, then when I look at the correlation between y and xj, it is distributed exactly as a correlation between y and its knockoff. So in a way, this provides a control for the significance of these genes. And what I'm trying to say here, pictorially, is to say that I have, you see what I'm doing is I'm starting with all these variables and they're arranged as a matrix, where the rows are people and the columns are variables. I'm constructing a, a new set of fake variables 
in such a way that I can sort of permute a variable not in the model with a variable a knockoff and nothing changes. That property is called exchangeability. And not only this, but I can start permuting anything I want. I can permute an original feature and it's uh, an original gene and it's fake gene and nothing changes as long as the genes are not in the model. All right. And what is he saying? It's saying something kind of interesting. It's saying that if I take a subset of genes, of variables that have nothing to do with what I'm studying, I can swap them with their knockoffs and nothing changes. Statistically, nothing changes. They're exchangeable. Okay, which is what you see here. Now, I want to go back to the, the big problem that we're trying to solve, which is this. Now, what I'm going to do, when I'm going to fit my lasso model, I'm going to augment the variables with the cheap, with these dumb knockoffs, these dummies. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run the regression not on the original variables, but on the original variable and the cheap fakes. And now, this is exactly the same data set as before, the one we saw over there. Okay, so this is somehow not working. It's exactly this data set. It's the same data set. Exactly the same data set. But now I run the lasso on the original features and their fakes. And now I have, well, now I have the lasso estimate for the original feature, but also for the fakes. And now I remember that when you're not in the model, now these guys, they cannot be in the model because I made them by cells. They, they are not physical. They are not SNPs. There's nothing. They're made by the computer. So they cannot possibly be in the model. Yes? Right. But still, and, and what do I do then? I look at the number of stuff I selected in both groups. Yes, but, but I cannot control the false discovery rate this way, right? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to do something that people call stability selection, where you would actually run a model on subsets of the data and try to understand how many times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but you're doing something else now. You're saying that perhaps I can specify, your, I, can, I can build a model on a half of the data and test it on the second half. Which is, you're trying to do something which is a bit different here. Here I'm trying to return a list of genes that have something to do with my problem. I'm not interested in, you know, giving a confidence interval for beta 1, for example. There's also another problem with what you say. And the problem with what you say is, what if... Um, Okay, all right. Yeah. There's also, to do this, you also need a sort of exchangeability in the Ys, which you may not have in a lot of problems. Okay, so, so if we go back to this example, now I run this regression on the original variable and the dummies, and I get this. But by this exchangeability, what I do, I get, well, that the lasso now select 49 features over here and 24. But by the exchangeability properties, the fact that knockoffs and true variables are exchangeable when they are null, when they are not in the model, I can sort of detect that there are probably 24 positive in here. And so if I were to, rep to report these black points, then my false discovery might really be like something like 24 over 49, which is close to a half, which is exactly what it is. Right? So, you have 24 positive among the 49 original features. Remember that the true FDP was like ex almost exactly equal to this. So I can estimate the false discovery proportion. Oh yeah, that's an excellent question. Can I do this multiple times? So, yes. And the thing is, what can be gained by doing it multiple times? That's an open research question. I'd like to, in the end, if there's time at the end, I'd like to discuss this. Okay. But yes, you can do this multiple times because there are not a single way of doing knockoffs. And what can you gain by repeating this? A very, very good question. 
All right. And so now you have, again, this curve that I was showing you. You have the red curve, which is your false discovery proportion. And now we have a new curve, which is a blue curve. And the blue curve is just counting the number of select knockoff selections over the number of selections. And what I'm trying to show is that this blue curve tri tracks the red curves. And so it's a very valid estimate of your false discovery rate or false discovery proportion. And now we're going to operationalize all of this to get a false discovery rate procedure, controlling procedure. And the method is simple. The method can be applied to any statistic you'd like, but because it's a lasso-centric talk, because I live in a lasso-centric department, I'm going to focus on the lasso. I want to compute statistics telling me how a variable is important. And this, I'm going to say, well, let's look at the first time the variable is picked up by the lasso. The first time it shows up on what people call the lasso path. If it shows up early, probably it's important. If it shows up late, it's not important. But I'm going to compute this statistic, but also the computing for its knockoff. It says, when do you occur on the lasso pass? Because that's my control. All right, so now we have two statistics. And what we see is the uh, first time the uh, true variable occurs on the lasso pass, and the first time its knockoff occurs it's it's on the lasso pass. And now I have two types of variables. I have the variables in the model, which are shown in red, and I have the variable not in the model, which are shown in black. By some of you who follow what I'm saying, by the exchangeability property, the value of the statistic for a true variable and its knockoff, when you're not in the model, it should be exchangeable. And what that means, it means that the distribution of black points should be roughly symmetric around the 45 degree line, which you see is true. For the variables in the model, though, something else occurs. It says, well, if, I'm, I, if I have a strong effect, I'm going to show up early, so large value along this axis, and I'm going to show you before dummy. And so I'm going to be below the 45 degree line. And that's what you see. That is, the strong effects show up over here. They occur early, and they occur before their knockoffs. OK. So now, what we're going to do is, well, we're going to do variable selection with this knockoff procedure, where, let's say, we do genome-wide association study. We're going to have, for each time, I'm going to show you the time at which you occur on the lasso pass. And each time, I'm going, to replay, I'm going to mark whether you occur or whether your knockoff occurs. OK, and we're going to select this way. So let me uh, try to give you a picture. I'm fitting the lasso path, and the, 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 signif the most significant variable that enters is a true variable, which is represented by this $100 bill. And then I continue. I select more. And the second variable that occurs is also a true variable. It's a true SNP. Okay, and the third is a true SNP. The fourth is a true SNP, but the fourth, however, is like I pick a knockoff. And what that says, roughly, if you follow what I'm saying, is that what that says is that in here there's probably how many false discoveries? One. Okay, I continue. Right, I continue until the last time where my estimated false discovery rate, which is the number of knockoffs I picked up along the way, along, um, divided by the number of variables I picked up along the way, is below my target, 0.1. And I st after it's above my target, I stop. Right? So I look at the last time the, between the original and the knockoff be becomes below target FDR level, and I stop. And that's what I report. And what I report is I report these guys. OK, so here's a movie showing you a bit how it, it works um, when you do this. So here we're going to have, you know, we have the values when the, the variables enter, the value when the dummies enter, and we're going to start including until the last time the ratio between what you see over here versus over here below becomes below 10% or 20% in this example. Right, so you run the knockoff procedure. You see your estimate of, FD, of false discovery proportion. You run it until the last time your estimate be, is, let's say, below 0.2. And there you stop. Right. 
and that's what you report. You're going to report all the guys which appear before the knock of, let's say, you know, we look, boom, that's the last time it's below 0.2, and you know, we're going to report all these green points, and in this case, the false discovery rate is very, very low, because you see there's no black point. Okay. All right. And the kind of the, one of the main results in this lecture is to say that if you do this, which is a very simple procedure, then this procedure is actually controlling the false discovery. Right? So you're going to try to include as much as possible until your knockoff estimate of false discovery proportion is below Q. And when you do this, you <laughs> control the false discovery. And also the directional false discovery rate that I discussed before. Okay, so this is result is kind of interesting because it says that if you look at what I'm saying, it's made no assumption whatsoever. There's no assumption about the design variable. There's no assumption about the noise level. There's no assumption about anything. It's a finite sample result that holds under no assumption whatsoever. The only assumption I'm making is that I can construct this knockoff, which I can always do by doing x wiggle equals x. But other than that, there's no assumption. Right? It works for any design and does not require knowledge of anything. Okay, and it controls the false discovery. So what it says, this procedure, is if you apply it on real data, then you should be able to guarantee some form of reproducibility. And that's what we tried. So we looked at, uh, for, okay, maybe I'll skip this. We looked at HIV data. And here the importance, the response of interest to us was to understand, um, you know, if you have a certain mutation, does it increase the response to a lab-tested drug. Okay, so the response Y is a log-fold increase of lab-tested drug and the covariates, explanatory variables, are whether you have a given mutation at a location on the genome. Now, I don't know the grand truth for this data set, and nobody does, but what we have, though, available is we have data about uh, lab-fold lab increase, and then we also have longitudinal data where people have looked at lots of data over a long period of time, and we have some sense of what has been reported prior to this study in the literature. And when, I run the, when we run the knockoff on this data, so you should look at the, this is for one type of drugs, you should look at the left plot, and the left plot you see two colors. Blue is a, no, is a discovery that we are making that has been reported elsewhere. Orange is it's a discovery we're making that has not been reported. It doesn't mean that it's not true. It means it's not been found before. And the black line is a number of mutations that have been reported elsewhere. And what's kind of remarkable in these plots when you look at the knockoffs run at it with a false discovery target of 20% is that we see a lot of blue, not much orange, indicating a true form of repl replicability. So if we look at this one, well, knockoff will make actually 27 discoveries, two of them, and two discoveries that have not been reported elsewhere, indicating a, a very high level of reproducibility as compared to an independent set of data. This is for a different type of drugs. And, um, and, uh, and again, we see a lot of blue. All right. Now, how do you prove these things? You, these are not easy things to do. It uses the theory of Martingales, but because my time is up, maybe I will skip this. Uh, but if people are interested uh, as questions, I'm happy to go through some of the mathematical arguments to show that by controlling the estimated false discovery proportion, you actually control the whole thing. And that uses the theory of Martingales that was actually taught to me by Professor Lai a long, long time ago um, uh, in a very essential way. Okay, so, you know, if you want to see the proof after the lecture, I'd be very happy to go through it. Uh, it uses an optional time theorem in the theory of Martingale. I'll skip the details. Okay, in the last five minutes, I want to convince yourself that what do you do when, when x wiggle is x? So, a lot of data sets have more variables than n number of samples, and that's a big problem because now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to test a model that is not identifiable. And so in itself, that's a scary proposition. Okay, so if I have in my genotype example, GYS example, I have 5,000 subjects, 
how can I possibly think, say something about 330,000 parameters? How is it possible? And in fact, I want to go back to your problem. as well, if I try to build knockoffs, the only thing that will do what I want is x wiggle equals x. And if I plug x wiggle equal x in all my theorem, everything works except I will control the false discovery rate. The theory goes through, but I make no discoveries because I cannot distinguish a true variable from a knockoff because they are the same. Okay. So what are we going to do there? And then maybe I'll just give you a glimpse. What you can do is what maybe what you had in mind now, which is maybe what we can do in such example is we can split the data. And on the first half of the data, we're going to screen for important things in a very liberal fashion. I want to look at select all the genes that have, have seem to have something to do with what I'm concerned about. Okay. And then, on the second half of the data, I'm going to build knockoffs for the things that have been screened in. And I'm going to run the knockoff procedure on the second set. Now, if you do this, everything will work out. In fact, it works out better than what you might think. And just for you who are interested in this, it says, what I can do is I have 300,000 variables. I'm going to screen for 1,000 promising things, maybe 2,000. Then I get a smaller model with 2,000 variables. I'm going to say, now I have a new linear model with different regression coefficients, because now, for those of you who follow what I'm saying, they are essentially the, co the regression coefficient that you get by regressing the response onto the screen variables. This is this coefficient beta s. And then you run the knockoff procedure, and you control the false discovery rate with respect to this guy. OK, so it works nicely. And um, you can do an increased power by doing, reusing the first half of the sample as much as you can. And we've done this, and maybe I will not bore with the detail, but practically it's important not to throw away data. So in fact, we have a, a, a knockoff with recycling version of all this, where we're going to re, when we're going to re, reuse a screen set as much as we can to increase power. And there's one way to do this, which I'm not going to describe. And then now you have a full con false discovery control procedure for arbitrary linear regression, which you can run on real data. And so here we took a uh, genome-wide association study. And so we looked at data given by the Northern Finland birth cohort. Uh, we, there are like uh, 12 phenotypes in these data sets. We focused on two of them. Uh, LDL and HDL, one is bad cholesterol, the other one is good cholesterol, I forgot which is which. And then we apply this data splitting procedure followed by knockoffs to actually find location on the genome that seems to have something with HDL and LDL. So we have built a full processing pipeline for GWAS uh, using these methods. And the results are very encouraging, so the method will do discoveries. And when you see a thick bar, it's a discovery that has been reported elsewhere in the literature. We had only 5,000 people in our study, but now people have genotypes 200,000 individuals. And when you see a thick bar, it's a location on the genome that we find significant, the knockoff finds, that have been reported elsewhere. And when you see a very thin bar like this one, it's a location we find which has not been reported. And so because we have a false discovery of 20%, we expect to make about 20% false discoveries. And it's exactly what you see when you look at the fraction of what we report versus what it seems to be about 20%. That's for LDL. And that's for the other type of cholesterol where everything we find seems to have been found elsewhere. And we don't have spurious discoveries. OK. And so it seems like it, it leads to, again, in high dimension, the form of reproducibility. And so it seems like it's all good. OK, so I spoke for too long. Um, does the truth wear off? I'm not sure. But that's certainly what a lot of uh, people claim in the popular media. Uh, we need a lot of energy to uh, address this problem, this data snooping followed by inference. Um, this work on knockoffs and the work of Benjamin and Hochberg and of many others, which I have not discussed, um, address this issue, and that's why it, these types of work need to be more well-known from researchers and students alike. 
Statisticians have been extraordinarily engaged in this problem and contributing doing a lot of ideas, but we need more. And I think I would like to invite you to this field and thank you for your attention.